Welcome back to the Ground Up Show. My name is Matt Diavella, and today I've got back on the podcast Chris Newhart. He's a DP filmmaker and friend of mine. He appeared on episode six way back when, and today he's here to help answer some audience questions. We've got about 10 questions on money, freelance, and filmmaking. It was a lot of fun, and I hope you guys like it. How does it feel to be back? You know, I went to Jimmy Kimmel, but <laughs> it was turned down, so yeah. I hit you up. Oh, so yeah, they couldn't have you on. Yeah. Just a scheduling conflict. Well, they told me I had to get two episodes of this in first. Oh, okay. I wasn't... You, you, got, you don't have enough experience yeah. yet. So, so I was have, like, let me get one more in. Let's get on the Ground Up show for the second time. <laughs> uh, you're the first repeat guest that I've had on the show. I'm kind of like a test subject for you for this. It was like the mm. first video one I did... And you figured out all your, like, for, with a guest, right? It was like where you did both or something like that. Yeah, actually, when I think back to it, I was pretty nervous yeah. for our interview. We've yeah. known each other for so long, but still I was like, it was a new thing for me to have an interview, to interview somebody on camera, both right. of us, you know. And you had like a dual platform idea for releasing it. Like, it's going to be an audio and it's going to be a video. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay because I won't judge you if you fuck up, which is nice. So if right. I'm coming back on, it kind of lets you figure out how you want to do comebacks for people. Yeah. So that you know how to figure out a platform you're for my, that. You're my test subject yeah. for all these, yeah. for this entire thing. Yeah. I it's, help you. I look dumb and I help you figure out how to move fast <laughs> yeah, and look yeah, good yeah, for yeah. other people. Exactly. Then I can course correct. <laughs> yeah. Chris correct. Yeah. Um, you, you uh, I think it back to that first episode. Uh, it was episode six. Uh, oh my God. Six. Over a year ago. And now I'm on, you know, this is gonna be past episode 70 it's gonna be some 74 or 5, 75 or something congrats to you thank That's you awesome. like it's really cool to see how much it's scaled since like a year ago yeah it's um it was just you know in the beginning i actually wasn't that consistent i would do an episode and then sometimes i would go two weeks i think the longest i did was maybe three weeks without an episode and eventually I hit a rhythm where I was like, all right, I need to start taking this seriously. I'm just going to start putting out one episode every week, which is a lot of work to find new guests, to meet new people, to get them yeah. to schedule to come on the show, and then also doing all the research that it takes. Plus you're planning um, a move. And then, then a cross-country move. That's going to throw the whole thing up. Like, how do yeah. you stay on schedule while also like, oh, I need to replace my home. I think that's the hardest thing for most people is that when they're starting something new, they don't plan for the those kinds of life changing moments or the moments when life gets in the way yeah. when you know we always have those moments where we're overwhelmed and maybe we can't go to the gym or we can't keep up our you know healthy eating routine and then we we let it go and then we never pick it back up again that yeah. to me is like one of the scariest things yeah is like that your life will fall apart and like you won't be able to pick the pieces back up again. yeah i mean just to even think about that gives me anxiety like the idea of like, okay, I have a routine and then something breaks that routine. And it's up to me to overcome the break mm. and like mend it so I can continue on a healthy path. But then like, okay, let's say two things break it. Okay. Well then I'm like, can I handle two things break it? <laughs> two different things? Like for me, it could be like not a, having a job for two weeks, but also it could be like an emotional thing, like a, a family member argument or, or something that just gets stuck in your head. And like throws you off routine in your case, like moving across the country and, you know, getting established here in a new city and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's like you have to plan for the worst case scenario. Yeah. And you have to also make sure that like, yeah, get back on track, but also don't give yourself such a hard time for those lulls. If you have like a right. few weeks or a month where things don't feel like you're making it doesn't feel like you're making any progress. It feels like you're you're, you're kind of standing still. That happens to everybody, but it's about like, can you pick the pieces back up? Right, can you get yeah. back, back into it? Yeah. I mean, that's like, on, even on set when someone is like, you can always tell who's professional and who's not. Cause like amateurs just flip out at the smallest shit. <laughs> like something goes wrong and you're like, yeah, this is what happens. <laughs> Everything's going to go wrong. It's up to you to like move past things and keep, keep that boat going. Right. You, know? you can like just see it in their eyes. <laughs> yeah. Like, especially for like, you know, whether it's a grip or somebody that's like, 
entry level type positions or an assistant. Like yeah. you just see it in their eyes. This they, is like, the last job of my life. It right, needs right. to be perfect. There's a lot of nervous energy. <laughs> like, and no, I think, it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that there's something good about nervous energy and mm. like, ha- I mean, maybe that's, I, I try to just justify my anxiousness like that. It actually helps me. I think there's something that's good about it. Cause you're always trying to like, uh, you don't want to screw up. You're trying to figure out ways to, to execute and to deliver for a client or for your boss or whatever. Yeah. But then you have to eventually let that stuff go. You can't like just be a neurotic mess yeah. for the entire time. You have to be able to deal with these situations as they come up. Hmm. Cause there's always problems. There's always problems. Oh my God. It's <laughs> like everything's so good. And then you're like, okay, a terrible thing happened. Yeah. Gotta keep going. Yeah. How co- why can't we, why, how come we don't see these things coming? Like, cause we've done so many shoots together and we've worked on so many jobs that you would think that we would be able to remedy those problems before they arise or yeah. we'd be able to foresee them as we're planning out a day. You know, you're going into a shoot, you've got a, like four interviews to get, you've got B-roll to get. Uh, where do the problems come up and, and why can't we see them? I don't know. I think, you know, there's, to me... <clears throat> To me, there's a little bit of like a, a confliction in my head of wanting to try new things and be adventurous in my creatives, like styles or ideas, um, but also knowing what works and then like how they kind of compete against each other a little bit. So like if you do the same thing every time and you get it to look good every time, that's great. Like that's awesome. That's a really good formula. Um, it's likely going to make you more successful because you know, the key to a lot of success is just consistency in like mm-hmm. most, you know, fields of industry. Just are you consistent with delivering success, successful products? So that can cause a little bit of conflict inside when you're like, oh, I want to do something different or new. So, okay, well, then you're not doing what you know works. And that is like, that's a hard thing to, to kind of come to grips with sometimes. It can be small and it can be big. Like, you know, for projects we've done together, we have like a, a good flow of like things we like to do, things we don't like to do. And those are completely different than the way I will film with other people. Mm. And like, you know, some people be like, I don't want any lights in the house. I want all lights outside the house. Okay, well, like that's fine. That'll be cool. But it's it's just different than maybe what the last like 10 shoots were for me. Mm-hmm. So how do I still make a successful execution of something, even though I'm doing something very different? When I know that hindsight and historically something works and I'm going against the grain to do something else and hoping that my knowledge of what works, I can apply that to make something else work. Yeah. There's probably a couple of things there. One is that you, when you're trying to execute on more ambitious and bigger ideas and bigger projects, you're always going to be pushing yourself into a situation where you maybe haven't done the full scope of that. Like you can take your previous skills and maybe Mm -hmm. lighting Say like you have a five, we've you know you've been working on five person crews for so long, and you have this much gear, and you yep. know exactly how to light for those situations. And then all of a sudden, you've got like a bigger budget, you've got yeah. a bigger crew to deal with. There's more problems. And then I would say the other side of it is that you're always dealing with humans who are flawed. So whether you're dealing with an actress that maybe isn't like you know I, yeah. for a DP or director, these are different challenges to overcome. But like you have to deal with an actress that maybe isn't hitting her, their mark or they're maybe not, you know, performing in, in yeah. the, how you envision it. Uh, or, or they say, can you move all the lights out of the way? It's too bright. Yeah. Or maybe and you're like, it just now <laughs> looks good. What do you mean? Move it. Right. Sounds like you've, this is something you've had to do. <laughs> I, it, I mean, it's a real thing. It happens. You know, you, you're like lighting to stand-ins. I mean, this is such like a specific situation, right? But this yeah. is a really good example one of, of like of the one of many things. This is something wrong. that can make or break a DP or a photographer or an art director is like if you design something, if it's lighting, costume, wardrobe, like, you know, white contacts for somebody to wear for a cool shot and it doesn't work for them. And like that's going to fuck your whole plan up. Right. So like, everything has to pivot. Mm-hmm. And some people can and some people can't. And that's really like you have to make yourself pivot because if you don't like you're going to fight something that is kind of not able to be won. You know, like you, it's a collaboration, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's not about you. Even if it's about you, it's not about you. Yeah. Right? Like think about how many times that we are just very disappointed with something that comes up. Like this is not how we envisioned it. This yeah. is not how we thought it was going to be. 
but here we are. We gotta, we gotta yeah. execute. We gotta deliver something to the client. So we gotta make it happen. Yeah, I mean that. Like to be specific with that, like if I'm lighting a scene and <clears throat> you know I have my lights in order to make it look good, they're hitting someone in the face, you know, with a lot of light in the front. And sometimes, like it's funny because I experience this myself. I have blue eyes. Blue eyes is super sensitive to light. Somebody might have blue eyes and they can't help but just kind of do a little squint or something and the director is like well why are they squinting it's because the light's there but if we move the light we gotta change everything because it's, it's not going to work this way hmm. so like that's a situation where like if you're not able to put yourself and you almost have to be empathetic like you have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes like okay well you know i wouldn't want somebody being like you have to do it this way even though it ruins your actual performance um like I wouldn't want somebody who's not a technician or a lighting person or a camera department person giving me like, you know, directions on what to do. Um, I can take their advice. I can take into what they're saying. I can be empathetic towards what they're asking. And that's up to me to make that decision on will I listen or will I say thank you, but I have to do it a certain way. Um, you know, and that, that kind of applies like to a lot of the creative field, especially if you're dealing with people who are not creatives in a creative field like producers or uh you know like managers um anything of that sort like business people and they just see the bottom line and and they don't really have time for a lot of that like am i figuring out how to pivot and how to work and how to collaborate very quickly and get like controversial and aggressive and all these things that can just make you feel like insecure about what you're doing and then that can like ruin the whole experience of, of a project really fast for somebody who's, you know, getting into the business, whether it's filmmaking or just freelancing in general, like, is there room for people who are assholes? I mean, I guess there is room yeah. for it because, like, it, you see it a lot. Like, they have to really make up for it with their skills, right? Yeah. And it's like, how, are you actually going to enjoy the experience of working with somebody who is a piece of shit like so many there are so many times when we are forced into situations where we're working with people that we might not want to work with or that may not be the best collaborative partner like how do you work with people who aren't nice to put it oh my God. nicely like how do we deal with people uh who don't show respect or who aren't actually listening to you that is like that's such a great question um because it's it's not really answerable. It's not really something that can you can put an answer to, but it's just something that you can kind of keep in your head at all times. I mean, I'm very lucky that like um, I have a lot of people that I work for and work with, which I think are two different things. Um, and sometimes uh, you know they can be like picky or aggressive or passive aggressive, which is the worst. Um, but they're generally they respect me. Now I have had that happen because I've made choices to eliminate work with people I don't like working with. Mm -hmm. And I'm very lucky that I'm able to say no to some people and turn down projects. Um, but that's, that's the thing that I went through for like half a decade where I was like figuring out how to be a creative that like was for hire. Cause I knew myself as like a full-time creative, even though I wasn't working full time in my head, I'm like, I do this every day whether I get paid for it every day or not is irrelevant. And it is relevant uh, because it kind of makes you approach it more like a businessman and not like a personal, like territorial thing. And it gets a little territorial. And I think that that is that same feeling that assholes have is a territorial over something they believe in or something that's theirs. It could be a director or a writer that's like, no, like, fuck you. It has to be my way. And you're like, oh my God, like, I hate this person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and that's a tough feeling. But, you know, how, how do you be an adult and deal with people you don't like, you know? Yeah. You, you got to kill them with kindness. You yeah. got to respect them. And usually the best thing you can do is just listen. Listen yeah. to what they're saying. Identify what their issues are. And try to counteract them positively. Yeah, I think it, it takes a lot of patience. And I think that there's two forms of patience. There's the patience and the actual communicating with them on a day-to-day -day basis and throughout the project yeah. and then it's also outside of you know an in-between of projects it's having the patience to realize that maybe this client isn't for you 
that maybe you've done one project with them before and you really didn't like the experience. It was really draining. And you decide, you know what, like it's not worth it for me. I'm going to be patient enough that I know another project's going to come down the road that maybe I can go a month without a little bit of work. Yeah. Yeah. I think. And there's, there's like, you know, there's two ways I think to kind of deflect those kind of clients or, or those kind of attitudes and people. And one way is a perfect excuse for anyone listening who wants to know how to get rid of crappy clients. I'm a little booked up right now. Maybe mm-hmm. we'll touch base in a couple months. Signed, whoever. Yeah. You know, there because anyone understands that you're busy, you're busy. You yeah. get it. They can't do it. I'm sorry. And- I'm a little booked up right now. Potentially in a couple months, it might be free, but you know, I'm, I'm on a six month project. It doesn't matter if it's real or not. Yeah. I've said this to plenty of people. Like, I'm like, in my head, I just want to be like, middle finger, middle finger, <laughs> get out of my life. Right. But in my email, it says, like, I just took on like a, a one year contract. I'm doing a work, and I, I, you know, I'm on retainer. So I'll let you know next year if I'm taking on new, yeah. new clients. And I think there is contracts. something to say about like closing doors and burning bridges. And like, right. you know, you don't necessarily want to flick somebody off. And, and, and first of all, you don't want to be rude because that person exactly. may end up recommending you down the road. Yeah, that's and usually knows? what happens. Yeah. And then, and then the, and yeah. You're like, what? And that might actually be an amazing <laughs> client that they yeah. recommend you to. And also, so like a year down the road, you could also be like, oh my God, I don't have any money. <laughs> like, I really yeah. need this project. I will work with anybody. Oh, but guess what? You told them to go fuck themselves. Exactly. And now you can't get exactly. That so that's why the busy thing is a, a perfect response because it's not disrespectful. You're not saying you don't want to work with them. Uh, Actually, just, it's showing you, your, it's showing your value. You're saying I'm booked up. Like, I'm really yes. sorry. I'm booked up. They're like, oh wow. Like he must be getting a lot of and work. You always, busy. you always bookend it with let's touch base again. Yeah. Even if you don't plan to, because it means you're open to communication, which yep. means on their end, they're saying, like, if you sent that to a creative you wanted to work with and you didn't know they didn't like you, and they said, let's touch base in a couple months, you would still keep that hope of like, okay, things are cool. It also allows them time to grow. And I think mm-hmm. that's really important is like, there's a little bit of like a wall that gets put up when you get fucked over by somebody in like entertainment or any kind of industry that's like, you know, this, this is all I know. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, but that wall gets put up and you kind of like, you know, shut someone out, burn the bridge, whatever. But we all need to grow. We all need time to grow. And like, if you don't have someone giving you time, like a chance to come back and show your growth, then like, you're really not giving some people the benefit of the doubt. I work with some people now who like three, four years ago, like I didn't want to work with them because they were assholes. And it's probably same for me. People who work with me now who like five years ago were like, Chris is a dick, you know, but I was going through some shit in my life. Like some serious shit that like I was taking out on people, taking out on business relationships, on projects. And it was giving me positive results in my work. And it was giving me horrible results in like my happiness and my business life. And so like that happens to everybody. You know, everybody goes through shit. So like now I've had time to kind of grow and hopefully be a better person. And I have these working relationships with people that you know, probably didn't want to give me the time of day. And now I can, I can do things for them now that show my value, show my work and show my growth that I probably would not be able to do successfully back then. Mm. You know? Yeah. I think we do need to drop a lot of assumptions that we have like, Oh, this person's acting like an asshole. Therefore they are an asshole. Yeah. And right. Very likely they might be just going through a tough time in their life. Uh, and you creating those assumptions or reacting from that place of negativity is not going to help at all. Sure, sure. Um, what do you say we answer some audience questions? I reached out on Instagram and I got a bunch of people. So we're going to be answering people's questions about primarily about filmmaking and freelance. Something cool. that you and I have been doing for many, many years. Sometimes successfully. <laughs> <laughs> every now and then. Yeah, every now and then we get it right. Um So I got a question here from Manny Peralta from Florida. Uh, His question is, during those dry months where freelance work isn't as fruitful, what are some ways you budget yourself in order to save as many pennies as you can? Ramen and rice has been my go-to for those types of months. So what Mm. do you do? Because obviously dry months happen. Like slow periods happen all the time. Uh, how do you manage for those situations financially? Um, well, that's a tough question because I'm not always able to really manage for them. I can manage in them when I find myself in them sometimes. Um, 
you know, every other, every year is completely different financially for me. Like some years I do really well, some years I don't, some years I have to buy all new cameras. Like I made, I did pretty good this year so far, but I also had to replace all of my cameras and all my, all my computers. Well, you also think about like, you know, <laughs> uh, not only dry months, but you having your car stolen, broken yeah. into all your gear stolen, yes. hard drive stolen, whatever yeah. it is. Keep like, going, keep going. That's good. <laughs> Falling into a manhole. I don't know if that actually helps or accounts as part of uh, that. But like, but they're, they're basically unforeseen financial yeah. woes are going to come in many forms. Yeah. And that can screw everything up. Like to be very specific. Okay. So um, maybe like a year or two ago, I had like $1,000 to my name the week that I came up to do that shoot for you. And I had finished the shoot. I had all this shit in my car. Uh, which is the dumbest thing ever. Anyone listening, do not leave anything in your car ever. Never. Ever, 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 ever. Three times I've lost everything. I did. I've only done it once where I've left and it, cause I was like, ah, the gear's not that expensive. It's two tripods and a Manfrotto stand. It was stolen. My deductible yeah. was a thousand dollars. I had to buy all the gear from scratch again. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I felt good about getting by for like two, three more weeks on a thousand bucks. I had some money coming in, but I was like, okay, I'm not, my bills are paid. This money's fine. But then I found myself owing, you know, I had to replace a car. I had to replace about $4,000 worth of gear that was, you know, I had rented. And uh, then also I had no gear. That was like not, I had to buy all this shit and it wasn't even mine, mm. you know. So very quickly, a $1,000 little nest was just completely gone. And I was forced to just put like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand 2000 on my credit card, which was the worst, you know. Because you, as a freelancer, like you have to, and you'll know this, you have to get rid of your debt. Like it's like yeah. you have to get rid of your debt if you're going to be a freelancer. Because you need as little overhead monthly as possible. So for me now, I've learned from these things. But you know, it's if you want to pinch pennies, sometimes it's really not about the foods, but it's about the lifestyle. So okay, getting cheap food, yeah, that's fine. You might find yourself if you eat enough cheap food, getting bad health from it and getting health problems, that end up costing more money. I find that like if you want to save money, you, you create a lifestyle that doesn't require a lot of spending. For me, it is I like to buy one or one or two video games every couple months, and I play them whenever I'm not working. I sit and I play PlayStation because uh, it doesn't cost me anything. You know, it's like a, two bucks a month in electricity, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then that'll get my time through, so I'm not going out with friends, not going doing stuff, going to the bar, or whatever. You know, as far as foods go, go to Sam's. <laughs> <laughs> buy a fuckload of food that lasts forever uh, if you know you're not going to be working a lot right like you can t it's all preventative measures I think um, yeah I think that's that's the, the, the main key to get out of it is that don't wait until the dry months yeah. to be like like well what do I do now like it's yeah. it's be very very intentional and smart with your money all the time yeah you know what I mean set these things up in advance because you know the dry months are gonna come you know that there's gonna be that emergency yeah. when you know your car breaks down and you need to spend a thousand dollars to fix it yeah. so make sure that you you save up as much as you can for me like I mean common financial advice is to have a thousand dollars in an emergency fund you had a thousand dollars and that. and like it helped but it didn't cover everything yeah. because when you're a freelancer or you're a filmmaker or you're an entrepreneur somebody who's doing things on their own it requires some more expenses you have to be yeah. assured during those you know circumstances where you get your gear stolen that you can afford it and sure. also like for me uh it, it really depends on how risky you want to take it but for me i'm pretty risk averse uh, having graduated with six figures in student loans, I, I never wanted to be in that place again. So for me, it was like, and also like having to move home with my parents because I couldn't afford to pay rent. I was like, I don't want to have to move back with my parents again. Yeah. So I'm always going to make sure I have six months rent. Yeah, that's great. In advance. I'm at that now. I wasn't there two years ago. Mm. But it took two years to get there. That's the goal. Yeah, to, you know? to get to that place. So you, you're probably not there yet. Most people aren't. Yeah, I mean it's it's scary to look at the numbers that like eighty percent of America is living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, like that is, that is scary because I know the weight that that has over you, and also the decisions that you make when you're under that kind of stress. Yeah, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, you're gonna start taking jobs just for the money, just because uh, it, it's it's gonna pay the next bill. Right, you start like you you devalue your own time and your own hours. 
and you're like, okay, so let's say I owe $2,640 in bills every month. If I just get enough work that covers exactly that, I'll be fine. The problem is it's 90 hours a week of work. Uh, I'll just do it, right? I'll mm -hmm. just, we'll just push through it. I'll do it. And that's what I did for like six years. I mean, like you can probably attest that I was like a shell of who I am now because I was always exhausted. I was always just like, oh, I just got done a shoot. I have to go edit for six fucking hours to get some dumb thing done. You were grinding. Dude. Yeah, just nonstop. I had, I had to do that though. Yeah. You know, I'm not talking down on it. I'm just saying that like it has its negative effects. And ultimately by doing that, by trying to fill every dollar with the dumbest things I could just to meet the bills, I ended up costing myself a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, so I wasn't able to make smart decisions. I wasn't able to keep up with things that needed to be kept up with. Um, and there's actually a really good analogy. I had a conversation similar to this to a friend not that long ago, and he told me a really, really good analogy. Um, so I'll share it with you guys. So um, slow times as a creative is essentially an umbrella. And you don't plan on it raining every day, but you don't want it to rain and not have an umbrella. So you got to make sure when it's not raining, you get yourself a really good fucking umbrella, right? Mm. So that you know, essentially what you're saying, being aware that slow times will happen. So when you're not slow, take preventative measures to ensure that you are okay, you're safe, you're eating healthy, you're covered, you're covered when it does rain and when it's slow. Great I love that, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that's really like good. This, I was like, that's that's a hundred percent how I feel because yeah. it's the worst feeling in the world when it's slow and you don't have money. It's the worst feeling in the world, you know. You go outside, it's pouring rain, and you're like, I don't have an umbrella. Yeah, I have nothing to cover me during this, you know, two three day storm. But I gotta get through it because that's what we do. So I think this is where, like, there, there's the advice. All right, have a thousand dollar emergency fund stashed away that's not in your checking account that's like hidden somewhere yeah. I, dave ramsey suggests cash in your apartment <laughs> right yeah like he says actually like frame it and it's yeah. like literally put only uh, break in case of emergency take it out in cash then you're not going to use it i hide uh, it in little things throughout my house <laughs> so it's all over the place <laughs> uh, but no that, that's smart because then like that's always there it's a little bit of security you have it uh next step would be uh you know get six months of of, of rent out mm -hmm. ahead of yourself. And I would say for those that are freelancers and creatives, like do this before you start to tackle your debt. For me, yeah. like I had that before I started to tackle my debt because as much as I wanted to get out of debt, I knew that I didn't want to put myself in a, in a sketchy situation. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to continue to be able to do this. And I wanted to live comfortably and I didn't want to have the stress and anxiety of having no money. So I had that built up and then you can start to chip away at your debt. You can be a little bit smarter. You know, be smart with your money and don't spend it on frivolous things that don't add value or things that, you know, aren't making Make a list happy. of what it costs to be you for a month. That's really important. Yeah, yeah. Do a Google spreadsheet. Like, Actually break it down. I was, I thought that my overhead was like three grand when I was living in Philly like two years ago. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you know, I think my overhead's like just about three grand a month. Like for all my bills, my rent, my car, my gear, buying it, shit like that. And I actually sat down and added up like, okay, how much is Netflix? How much is Pandora and Spotify? Oh my God, I forgot I had both. Okay. And then I just go through all the things that take out monthly the adobe that went up ten dollars three months ago you know and that's sixty dollars a month now and then i made that list and it was forty two hundred dollars it was twelve hundred dollars more than i thought it was which meant i thought i was making enough money to cover myself and i was not and that's why i never had enough money to cover myself more than the month that i was living and that was really crappy to figure that out but it was a defining moment when i knew because then i was like i gotta get at least a thousand dollars off of this now and then i was able to make smart decisions that would be a huge thing i would say to add that add to it's always going to be more than you think yeah it's oh because like going out to dinner going out for coffee these little things yeah. add up and i'm not saying don't do those things i'm just saying we should be aware of how much our, our standard of living currently sure. is and how much it costs we have a question from matt de silva from real community talks on average for your short films, what kind of turnaround time should clients expect for the finished project? Is that negotiated beforehand or do you set windows like one month, one week, et cetera? What is considered when determining finished finished project timelines? Hmm. It's a good question. And I think it really cuts to the core of 
how we communicate with our clients. Yeah. Because the I've only had a couple serious, seriously negative interactions and, and moments with clients. One of them specifically when I didn't clarify the deadline. Yeah. When I didn't get out in front of it and talk with a client and say, um, so yeah, this is gonna, I'll probably be able to turn this around in a week or giving them an exact deadline. Uh, what I did was assumed that they would expect it within a, two weeks or so. And then I ended up going like an idiot. I went away to my cabin for a couple of days, my parents' cabin, which was totally off the grid, no connection. And I'm just editing up there and just enjoying my time away, being disconnected. And I come back to 20 missed phone calls from this client and like all these texts and emails. And he had expected the next day turnaround time. That was his expectation that I was going to get it shot and then the next day have it to him edited. He was an idiot. <laughs> he was an <laughs> idiot for having those. He was immediately fired as a client. <laughs> yeah. He had way too high of expectations of what that turnaround yeah. would look like. But at the same time, I. You fucked up too. I am completely at fault. You have to take yeah. full responsibility for not communicating and saying, hey, like, what kind of turnaround time were you thinking on this project? Do you have a deadline when you really need this out? He says next day, I say, all right, well, that's going to be four times the cost. Right. <laughs> you know, I can do it, but it's going to cost you a lot more money because that's going to require me, you know, not getting any sleep tonight and working to, to get this done in a rushed manner. And not only that, but you're dropping anything and everything you had to do tomorrow, which yeah. could be other clients. You're pushing, yeah, you're pushing other client work back. Yeah. Like there's a lot of reasons yeah. why you would want to change your rate in that regard, but you need to get out in front of it. And like, you need this list of questions to ask your clients beforehand. Yeah, the setting of expectations. I have been... I mean, this is a very interesting question because it's a varying answer. So there is no way to set or determine a specific timeline without having a conversation with who the video is for. You can't decide your own timeline. That's the first thing, my advice on this is never make up your own timeline for a project. So I've had clients that have been like, oh, how long does it take to do the video? And I'll be like, ah, I could probably do it in like, I don't know, seven to 10 days. Um, however, I don't realize that they're going to want like 10 fucking revisions mm. and they're going to give me a million notes and we're going to go back and forth. And now we've hit five weeks and now that ex that, ex um, expectation that I've set makes me look bad. It makes me look like I'm not able to keep up with my word, whether or not that true is like is true or not. doesn't matter. It's the perception of it. So like when I have the conversations now with clients, I say, okay, well, let's talk about the post-production process. One, are there deadlines that I need to be aware of, which would be, when do you need this released? And if you're talking to a business client, business clients work in quarters. All businesses rank quarterly throughout the year. So first quarter, second quarter, and so on. They might say, quarter four, beginning, we need this released for our marketing plan. Okay, well, quarter four is like October. So, um, you know, October 1st, let's say, is like our hard deadline. So then we work backwards. Okay, well, how long does it take to edit? The first edit might take, you know, three days. But I might not want to give it to them on day three because I might want to take a day to step away, come back, see if it's still good, you know, that kind of stuff. And you have that conversation. Um, you know, that being said, on the other side of it, like if you're um, not a business client and you're creating something like just for fun, like narrative, like a short film... Like we just had a short film that like I got a lot of shit from the people that worked on it. They were like, <laughs> "Where the fuck is this short film you shot?" And it was the one I borrowed your drone for. Yeah, and you know that was forever ago. That was January of sixteen or something or seventeen. Mm -hmm. It was a long time ago, seventeen. And it took me eleven months to edit a twenty-minute short film. Eleven months. I'm a really good editor. <laughs> I, could, I could have edited that. You weren't like, learning the application. Right. It, was, <laughs> it took 11 months because yeah. that's how long it took to mm -hmm. make that film. And that was me, you know, getting, getting in scores from composers and then realizing that like I, my side wasn't competing as well with theirs, like their work. And, and so that's something where like, if you would ever tell me like, what's it going to take you like a year to edit this 20 minute short? I'd probably be like, no, of course not. That's absurd. It would never take a year to get this out. Yeah. I think but then it did. Yeah. And I think it's probably also <laughs> has to do with the fact that that's not a paid project. Right. That's a passion project and the bills need to get paid and, and clients yeah. that's the trouble and, and the difficulty in having and working on side and passion projects is because very easily they're pushed 
to the side yeah. so then you can focus on what's making you money and that's like that was the story of my life for as long as i did client work yeah um and i think that's a, a hard transition to make if you're trying to work on your own personal projects but just expect that it's going to take way longer than it yeah. necessarily would i'm going through that right now like in real life so when i go back home i have a lot of client work i gotta get done in the next like three months to meet like fourth quarter releases Unfortunately, and fortunately, so both good and bad, I am also pursuing my own documentary right now. I have been for two years. It's been a slow process. It's taken me you know, out of the country, and it's very, very, very expensive. Um, I mean, obviously, you know this. You're doing your own, you know, when you did minimalism, you're like, yeah, I just got to put a lot of money into it up front. Yep. I got to do this. I got to spend the time. Um, and I'm already two years in, and I'm like 6% of the movie done. Right. So people are like, how long are you planning on working on this? Like, realistically, it'll probably get done in like four or five years. Hmm. Like, done, done, where you're watching the final film. I might get it 90% of the way there this year. Who knows? But it's going to take time, and I have to be smart. I have to prioritize properly, both financially and with my time. You get a client, you know, you got to make sure you make your clients happy. Because they're going to yeah. pay for you to live they're going to pay for you to do side work uh, i mean they're projects. yeah they're essentially helping you to fund your personal projects right so it's very important yeah um i think to to piggyback on what you were talking about with kind of you know setting these deadlines and communicating with the clients always give yourself more time than you think yep. and like a lot more time like i know i could edit many videos in two days so i say two weeks for the first draft, the first version. And I make it clear that like from there on, we're, we'll go into the revision process. And I also uh, specify the amount of revisions included per project. Yeah. So, or per video, whatever. Say if it's a set of five videos, I'm including two revisions in cost per video. Right. And then we can, I don't even like, I'm like, all right. And then after that, we can talk about and negotiate what that would be sure, sure if we had to go into more revisions we can even we could do hourly or we could just set a whole project rate for like all right we can do you know two more revisions per video for this much money yeah and that just it covers you it makes them not want to do more revisions than, than they have to like nobody wants to do 10 to 15 revisions yeah. but if it if you're giving them unlimited free you know wheel yeah. they can do whatever they want they're going to use all, they're going to go 10, 15, 20 revisions. They're going to, oh, can you tweak the color? Can you tweak this? Shot can you by do this? shot. Shot by, by shot. shot. <laughs> it's going to happen. So you need to try to, you need to add a little bit of friction for them to not want to do that. That's also going to, uh, it's going to make it so they don't take advantage of you. And also you're going to get the project done sooner so you can get on to the next one. Sure. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Great question, Matt. Yeah. Question from Jacob Jolly. He's a filmmaker from Oklahoma. Do you have any tips for freelancers looking to transition from creating wedding films to shooting for bigger clients? Hmm. We both went through that. Yeah, we did. <laughs> this is a question for us. You don't do any weddings anymore, do you? Have you done no, maybe one? No. Yeah. I know you've like helped some friends out every once in a while. But. Maybe once a year I'll shoot a friend's wedding for free yeah. just like to help them out. That's like the nicest thing ever. I don't care about my friends enough <laughs> to do that i'm like no nah, sorry i'd rather shoot their wedding and then just give them footage than like give them a check right because it yeah it, weddings are expensive yeah like this. i'd rather give them a check <laughs> i'm like i'm I don't a, want to i want to actually like have fun i yeah. don't know but it's uh you're yeah. gonna you're gonna hate this advice but i'd say yeah. um get out of oklahoma <laughs> get out of oklahoma no i'm just kidding well but, you know put, well make yourself aware that like you have to be realistic about the work you're pursuing. You know, what kind of work takes place in Oklahoma? You know, do, do a breakdown. Is there a lot of commercial work being done? Okay, if there is, who is making it? What agencies and what companies? Uh, go meet those people. Go walk into their offices and introduce yourself. And, uh, you know, just start on that path. For me, getting out of wedding work was, it was difficult because it was scary because that was where most of my money came from. You know, at the, on weekends I was doing weddings and during the week editing them. And at nighttime I was doing music videos and other dumb little things here and there, corporate stuff. But nothing really paid the bills the way that weddings did. Um, but the problem with that and the problem that most people who do weddings find is you once you start doing weddings, it takes a year to get out of doing weddings. It is not a I'm done today thing. It is 
I'm no longer doing weddings, except for the 14 I already booked in the next 12 months. Dude, that happened to me. <laughs> where I'm like, I was like, I was totally over it. I was like, I'm done with weddings. And I'm like, fuck, I got all next summer. The yeah. entire next summer. And like, you're talking weekends during the summer. And that's job. That's real jobs you cannot take now. Yeah. Someone's like, hey, what are you doing? And you're like, a fucking wedding I booked a year ago when I was still doing weddings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't get out of it because <laughs> it's in two weeks. It's rough, dude. Yeah. Um, the work that you do now is the work that you're going to get in the future. Mm-hmm. And that's true of weddings. That's true of music videos, corporate work. Like, the because those clients will talk with other people that are very similar to them. Like, think about the clients that you have in weddings. It's brides and grooms. And they're going to be talking about this amazing video or the, this amazing photos that you delivered for them. And they're going to they're gonna talk it up to their friends who yeah. may potentially want to hire you. That's the same thing for a corporate client or a startup in tech companies. They often interact and communicate with other tech founders and tech companies. Those are going to be the, the clients that you're going to get. And also, the people that are coming to your website, those that are seeing your work, your reel, you can't show wedding videos to a corporate client. No, you can't. You're never going to book a, a, a video like a, you know, Five and, figures. And let, let's explain why, because that's yeah. really that's a huge thing you just said, and you do not understand the weight of of what like Matt just said unless you've done what we've done, where you stop. Here is why you do not want to show a wedding to someone's you know corporate client or whatever. I will never trust someone who does weddings currently with a large campaign project because I am never going to tell them, like let's say I'm an agency person or I work for some company, I need a bunch of content made. I wanna do 10, 15 videos. This guy does weddings. What does that tell me? One, his gear is probably not that great. Two, probably is either overworked or overbooked. Availability is gonna be tough. And like we just said with weddings, you're booked out for a long time, which means I might be like, I need something next week. And he'll be like, I got a fucking wedding next week. And also every weekend for 40 weeks. Mm -hmm. So I can't do that. Okay. That makes me not want to work with you. Three, if you're doing weddings, there's nothing wrong with doing weddings. But when you want to transition out of it, usually there's a financial burden that how do you, how do you replace that money with work you don't have? And that is like, sometimes it makes me feel like people are afraid to like, like I almost trust people who are willing to be freelance and not take a job. People who take their job very seriously uh, with really, really expensive projects as opposed to people who work all the time uh, doing wedding work and stuff like that. Like I don't necessarily bring those people onto the bigger jobs I have. Even like me as a DP, like hiring a crew. I know some really good crew, but they do a lot of wedding work. I don't want them on my sets. It's just a little bit too much crossover. The experience is different though like the experience of shooting a live event versus shooting you know a a video for a startup company is very different i just think about like showing that video to the startup founder yeah they're not gonna see it like they want to see like i i think it, it comes down to it that the people that are looking at the work aren't filmmakers or photographers they're not in that world so they can't say uh, take that and then like change the music out and then change the visual out yeah. and make it uh, You know pitching a startup video They right. want to see another startup company that you made a video for that has the nice similar tone and similar style mm. They don't want to see like some a bride crying and like kissing the groom and like, you know what I mean It's it's just mm. totally different and you want them to be able to envision the work that you're gonna give them. Yeah And it's, it's tough man. I mean, it's a hard transition And my advice for getting out of it and pursuing new work is, one, figure out what you want to do. Like, let's say you took wedding work completely out of your schedule. What is it you want to do? Do you want to be doing commercials? Do you want to be doing documentaries, short films, you know, docu-life projects, things for Vice? Figure out what it is what you want to do and then make like three projects completely for free on your own, produce them yourself even if it's for friends. I did this last year when I rebranded. I was like, well, I don't have enough of this kind of work in my portfolio. So I hit up some friends who ran businesses and I made like a couple commercials. Mm -hmm. And then that booked me on like a bunch of real commercials. Well, think about stuff that we did together. Like if I was hiring you to shoot a video for a company, 
you would just ask me like, "Hey, can I use that the video that we made for as a part of my yeah. reel?" Yeah, and then yeah, sure. Of course. I want to show somebody who wants something that I've done what they were looking for. Yeah, and even if I haven't done it through my company and I worked on it like with your company or whatever, like if I didn't have you or didn't have other people like you, I would just go make something like that myself locally. Yeah, and I think that that's better than either you do it your vision, do a fake spec commercial for yeah. a brand or product that you love versus doing shitty work for free for a client that you don't like. Right. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. Like just execute on your own vision and get creative and have fun with it. Um, and also like, you know, weddings are amazing, especially when you're just getting started out. Yeah. I know that like, it's not for everybody. Some people love it and, and can work an entire lifetime in weddings Yeah, and they can truly uh, continue to have a, passion in that and i think that's great and i say more power to you um but also i think it's an amazing way for people to get experience behind mm-hmm. a camera yeah. uh learn to, to get, deal with stress learn to deal with stress learn yeah. to deal with clients and like you also realize that oh this is why i charge a premium because you have to deal with the emails the phone calls and everything else that yeah. goes along with it that you don't you don't it's not well, just that's, that was gonna be my number day. two yeah for getting out so number one is figuring out what you want to do number two is if you want to get out of weddings, raise your prices. Just raise them up significantly. I think just across the board, <laughs> always be raising prices. Yeah. Always like if there's a year that goes by that you haven't raised your prices even a little bit, then you're making a huge mistake. Yeah. Because what's the difference in the beginning between four hundred and five dollar project? To the client, it's nothing. They like the hundred dollar difference is nothing. Yeah. And then honestly, like it'll you can just keep raising it from there to we go a thousand to fifteen hundred. It, you know, the difference doesn't seem like that much. It's yeah. not that crazy. And then fifteen hundred to three thousand, and then eventually you're at a premium rate, and yeah. you can pretty much charge whatever you want. So if you're charging like four grand for a wedding, and you're like, I want to get out of weddings. Okay, start all the rest of the wedding or the rest of the year. Just raise your prices to like sixty five hundred. Oh, four weddings. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, double it. Fuck. Like yeah, like eight thousand dollars for a wedding. You're like, yeah, that's it. So here's here's what's gonna happen. One. You're not going to book, right? So let's say 70% of the people that say, hey, I want to do a wedding video with you. They're not going to book it, which is great. That's exactly what you want. You don't want to be doing weddings. <laughs> the other 25% of the people go, let's do it. And you just booked a fuckload of money with a very little bit of work. You're doing a fraction of the weddings. And that is the For goal. about the same amount of money, yes. or if not more money. And then what you do is you pay somebody else to go shoot those <laughs> weddings so you don't have to do it. And then you've isolated the rest of the weddings out. You've taken them off and you've made your profits. And now you're actually out. Then if you're smart, you save that money and you push into your new territories. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Simple. Yeah. Raise your money. Or raise your your, your, your your, costs. Raise your money. (laughs) Raise your money. (laughs) Oh, God. Uh, That advice cannot be given enough. Uh, It kind of segues into this because we just shit on Jacob for living in Oklahoma. Uh, no, Oklahoma is a great place. I love Oklahoma. I I've actually been there. It's awesome. Have you? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I have. I've flown over it. Uh, Chris Temple, who was actually on the podcast, uh, he has a company with Zach and Garasi called Living on One. They've got a couple documentaries on Netflix that are great. Oh, hell yeah. Um, so he asked a question on Twitter. How important is location? Can you truly find success outside of a major hub like LA and New York, even if it's San Francisco or DC? How important is the location that you're living to the work that you're doing? The bigger budgets you get, the more likely the clients will be willing to send you anywhere. When I was just starting out, the projects that I was getting were $400, $500 per for a project. There is no way a client is going to send me across the country, spend $600 on flights round trip, as well as, you know, staying at a hotel for three nights and the rental car and all that stuff if the project is $400. Once you get higher budget projects, which is like obviously the ideal scenario when you're getting thousands of dollars for a project, it's way more likely that you can get clients anywhere and you're not restricted to just your area. When you're living in New Jersey and you're working on small projects, everything has to be local and you're dependent upon these like local small businesses uh, to survive. And then I think as you grow, as you get bigger budgets, as you work with these bigger companies, then that opens you up a little bit more to not be so location specific. I completely agree. Um, I think there's a part of it though that is really important, which is you have to define what you believe success is. 
Like, you know, what does it mean to be successful? Is that finances? Is that meaning you've made $100,000 for the year? Does that mean you did not make $100,000, but you're working every day and you're getting paid for it? Does that mean you've worked on high profile stuff that everyone's looking at? Like viral videos or feature films or TV shows? And maybe you're only making 50000 a year working on them, but you're, you got some good credits. There's different ways you can be successful. And you have to really figure out what that means. Um, I think all three are definitely doable, but I think not all three can be done anywhere. So if you're living in the middle of Kentucky, you're probably not going to work on a show that shoots in New York City, realistically. So you might have to go there or Los Angeles. Like you're not going to be a part of some of those projects. You could work on a documentary. Those can take place anywhere. You could work on editing things for people like a remote editor. You could be doing a lot of things like that. But I think figuring out what the success is like super, super important. So for me, I was very lucky that the first half of my career, I made no money and I had all of my work. I, I was like, everything I was like working on was like going viral. So like I wasn't making any fucking money. You had the views, but, but you didn't I had the views. The so I was like, within like a couple of years, I was at like I don't know, like eighty million views on my stuff, and I was like, "Fuck yeah, I'm good. <laughs> like I'm successful." Yeah. But I had nothing, nothing to my name, <laughs> nothing. Uh, and now I work on things that are much smaller, that are not necessarily like music videos or viral videos and stuff like that. You and I just totally switched paths. Yeah. <laughs> Because yeah. now I am getting views, but I have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I have yeah. no money. We totally took a, a change, of course, there. But, like, yeah, it's definitely about, like, um, I think there's also a difference there in that, like, the views you were getting, you also didn't have ownership over yeah. that content. Wasn't you're, mine. You're creating stuff and you're pushing it out there. And ownership became a huge thing for me because, yeah. like... Um, and like, as you, you're experiencing now with making your first documentary, it's like, this is yours. You can put your entire creative say yeah. and your passion into it, your heart into it, however much money you want, uh, because you believe in the project. Yeah. And I think it takes, uh, it, t it takes a lot to be able to do that. Yeah. And it, it's not always so easy. So I don't know if like this is, I mean, he provided two locations. I don't know if that's because he's bi-coastal or if he's in LA just used here, to do that, but uh, I would say that like DC has a not so great film scene, but Baltimore does. So like, and when okay, you say film the, scene though, like, is it uh, like as in working production companies? Sure. Like of actual caliber for big agencies and stuff like that. Okay. So as it, opposed to just like a freelancer, like you could just be a freelancer doing like video gigs and you may not make a lot of money, but you could work probably every week in DC. I mean, there's people mm. doing it, right? I think maybe because we both have different approaches to it where you might encourage people to work for agencies and production well, companies sure. and as like, like a things, DP, things yeah. that create, well, even if you're a grip or even if like, if just a general filmmaker, like finding companies that do consistent work, not, I think there's a big difference between like, like I have some clients, I don't work with them anymore because they're fucking jerk offs, <laughs> but I had some clients that were in. They were just so important for me starting my freelance career. Yeah. It was like my four main clients. And one of them like worked, I won't say any names, but like one of them was like a company that did a lot of videos, like two to three videos a month for like Penn, like ho hospitals, mm -hmm. like in the area, you know? Uh, <clears throat> so we would go in and interview doctors and like film them doing a surgery or film them doing some shit. Um, but like it was really, really important for me as a young filmmaker who was not really in the best location. I was in like the suburbs of Philadelphia, not even in the city. You know, they were giving me a consistent like $800,000 a month in shoots. That was important. I had to find three to four or five clients like that that could provide consistent work. Now, that's a little bit different than you being like a director or filmmaker doing like a commercial or something that's not every month. Yeah. You know, those are like, like if you get a client, like we, I don't know. If, not everybody's going to get like an envision or something like that where it's like a long term project. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's like a short video that might be great for like a month, but you may not have them coming back next month. And you, you should want reoccurring work if you're starting out in, especially in a location that's not, you know, paramount for working a lot. Yeah. Getting retained clients, getting clients that come back is it's, it takes a lot of effort 
and relationship building and building trust with clients. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just so much easier for them to come back to you for work. Uh, I think it's opening up for people that are just freelancers, especially as like uh, video is becoming more and more in demand online through like Instagram and, and like, you know, anybody who has uh, is trying to connect with an audience online, whether it's a barbershop or, you yep. know, a hair salon or whatever, uh, they will, they see the value in video, whether it's one video, a short clip, or it, they yep. want to actually create consistent content over a long period of time. I think it's opening up to where you can do it in these smaller areas to get started. Yeah. And then that's your decision. Once you like you, you establish yourself in one of these smaller markets, whether you're in Oklahoma or Jersey or Pennsylvania, then you can take a step back and say, all right, like, do I want to stay here? That's sure. what both sure. of us have done. It's like, well, we, we've established ourselves in these smaller areas. And then once you're doing well, you and, and naturally people might want to move for a number of different reasons. Once you get to a really good place, you restart. <laughs> You're like, let's just start over. Let's just throw everything area. out the window. Yeah. Um, but then, I mean, that was definitely something that I was worried about a lot in the beginning was like, I can't move away from New York. Hmm. And then I know you just had this too. And then all of a sudden you step back and you're like, you're, you're worried about this for so long. Like I'm so, I'm, I'm kind of trapped here. I can't leave because all my clients are here. And then you step back and you realize I don't have any clients that are in New York anymore. <laughs> Literally, I'm flying to San Francisco like yeah. eight times a year because that's where all my clients are. Yeah. And that's going to happen naturally. And then you realize, okay, things are opening up a little bit. I'm yeah. not necessarily stuck here. But the decision about where you're going to live is, is, I would say, has to be largely, uh, it's going to be personal if you can sure. do work from anywhere. Uh, let's do a couple more questions here. Uh Okay, this is a question from Kaloum Davies, uh, very similar to what we were talking about from the first question about these lulls or dry periods. But they're asking, how do you stop yourself from getting down in the dumps when you're not getting work? I think it's Ooh, like a different yeah. thing because obviously the money is one thing, but then the emotional toll of not getting work is, a, is an entirely different thing. Oh, man, that's a heavy one. I completely relate to that. I like, oh, okay. So <clears throat> regardless of the money aspect, um, there's two things I think you should consider here, which is if you're not working, you're not making money, but also you're not feeling productive. You're not feeling fulfilled and you're not feeling valued. Like people don't want to book with me equals in my head. People don't want me. They want somebody else because they're still making the products. They're just going to somebody else. And it has nothing to do with me. It's usually just the work or the timing or whatever. But that's like that's a really heavy part of it. And then it's made worse because you don't have the money to kind of like I, I've had times where I've gotten pretty depressed because I'm not working. And, you know, it's been it's been bad. But I've also had times where I've been working and I made money and then I stopped working. I didn't do anything for six weeks. Uh, and I was still depressed, but I had money, you know? So it's like, those are totally different kinds of times. So to be the most effective in this question, I would say, let's talk about when you don't have money and you're feeling down in the dumps. Cause that's like a heavier hit. Um, and that to me is like what a lot of creatives go through. Cause it's very often do people complain they don't have work when they have a bunch of money in the bank, you know? Like that's not, that wouldn't be, they'd be like, oh, I'm in my off time. Cause I made a, I made 30 grand and it's in my account. And I'm fine for three months. As, that's a lot different than someone's like, I have 900 bucks and I have no, nothing on the calendar well, for was, seven weeks. For, yeah. For me, I was like, I, I, you know, made some money and I was like, uh, I, I had a little bit of a lull in work. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to start a podcast. <laughs> yeah. There's like things that you can do to fill that time yeah. that aren't necessarily related to money. But when both hit you at the same time, it's definitely tough. I don't want to take it away because from from people who are slow, but they've been smart with their money because that it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's not equal, but it still is a scary proposition sure. to look at your calendar and see nothing. Yeah. You're not you don't you're not doing weddings. You got nothing booked for for this foreseeable future. Yeah. And you're like, well, I do, I have a limited amount of runway. You know what I mean? Whether it's four weeks or it's an entire year, but eventually you're like, I need to get work somehow. But like, so how do you, and how do you deal with that? 
time. I deal with it by doing creative things that are not related to filmmaking or photography. So for me, that is rearranging like a room, like furniture. It sounds so <laughs> stupid, but it's, it's a checklist of things I can easily do to make myself feel better. It's going for a bike ride. It is. Uh, dude, I love the rearranging cleaning. of the furniture. Yeah. That is so silly. But also, it's like, an easy I, like, win. I used to like love that when I was when yeah. I was younger How and like rearranging my bedroom. Dude, your bedroom? It's like fresh. It's like wow, it's like a different room. <laughs> easy wins, right? Yeah, make the bed. You know what I mean? Clean yeah. up and easy wins. It's, focus on yourself. Like exercise, go to the gym. Yeah, you really take advantage exercise of that time. Is great. Yeah, great advice. Start to develop those habits when work is slow. Yeah. Um. Paint, paint, paint a room, paint a, paint a wall. Yeah. Change it up. Like those are things that, um, should we keep going? Yeah, no, we'll just, <laughs> there's sirens, helicopters, there's airplanes. There's a rest uh, happening outside. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, honestly, I think that it's really important if you have not much work coming on and you're trying to be low cost. Um, but even if you are and you have money and you're okay with spending money, like figuring out things that benefit you and bring you happiness that are not related to your work usually get you through the times because there's nothing you can really do to make work get booked you can try to help the process as much as you want you can reach out you can cold call create a new website do reels whatever the fuck you want to do those things will help the process but ultimately it's up to the other person sometimes if they want to book or not you can't force the yeah work. you can't force when you're freelance you can't force work to happen and when you do when you're trying to force it it's like quicksand it's harder and harder yeah. to get the clients when and they know it yeah they know that you're you're, you're like hey you got hey, any work yeah. what's up <laughs> hey just wanted to reach out to see if yeah. you know it's like i would have reached out if i needed to work yeah <laughs> you know 90 90 percent of the time <laughs> nobody's like hey well i'm glad you reached out yeah like i've been meaning to give you five thousand dollars <laughs> yeah exactly um no, I think, yeah, that's that's good. I think that's great advice because, like, those lulls are always going to happen. Mm -hmm. And as far as I've been through it, as long as I've done it, I've always come out of it. There's always been work at the end of the tunnel. There's always So it's about getting through those really, those low periods or the slow periods. Uh, it's, like, reading a lot of books. It's listening to podcasts. Yeah. It's, it's staying, like, inspired and motivated and knowing the reason why you're doing this and knowing that, yes, it's going to be tough at times, but it's worth it to stick through. Yeah. Uh, I think the balance between those things uh, is key. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Let's do a couple more. Martin Rosas from Illinois. When are you happy with your filmmaking gear in an ever-changing market? Where there's a new camera and new lens that comes out every week. Mm. The first thing you can do is understand that no gear will bring you happiness. That is the most important thing. It is a tool and only that. Do not get emotionally attached to anything you buy. Specifically filmmaking gear. Because, I mean, think about it, right? The whole red. You were like fucking jumping up and down when you got it. And it's gone already. Yeah. <laughs> And I was like, wow, well, that was a lot of money I wasted. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it was utilized, right? So it's mm -hmm. like you bought the C300. It was a lot of fucking money. Yeah. But then you you used it for what you used it for, and you got rid of it when it was done. And now you have another one, you know, mm -hmm. like the next model. Yeah. And it's so cool, right? And we got all these little Sony cameras here. They're so great. They're, so, they're going to be gone in a fucking year and a half. Like, we can be honest about Five that. years people would laugh at you for using these cameras. Yeah. I ha I wonder if the quality if anybody would know the goddamn difference. Nah, I think cuz I think the way that it's going, it's pride. It's all pride. It's all pride. Like I mean, are we all going to have 5K monitors at the time and like is somebody going to be able to I don't know if my phone can't even load an Instagram photo sometimes <laughs> right. what the fuck do I care about like is it Sean Red or Alexa like it doesn't make <laughs> for like online shit at this yeah. point it's not that big of a deal and but I think that's actually good for people that are just getting started out who don't have much money to spend on a camera yeah. is you can buy my I when I made minimalism I shot it on a Canon C300 Mark 1 that camera you can get used for a couple thousand dollars now. Dude, like two grand. That when I bought it, it was fourteen thousand yeah. dollars. That's a very expensive, high-end cinema camera that produces a gorgeous image. And people are like, "Oh, that's the old version." I'll put my 1080p C300 up against most people's red cameras. Yeah, any day, because I know how to make it look good, right? Well, and look at I mean, we, we, you colored minimalism. We played that in theaters. Yeah. Not F one person watched that and went. 
Mm, doesn't look 4K to me. Yeah, yeah. Like, doesn't look good. Does yeah? That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Yeah. Um. Don't get too caught up on yeah, on the 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 gear, the cameras, the lenses. Um, and only buy shit if it's gonna make you money. Like, there's there's so many stupid like the last decade I've probably spent. I don't know, fifty thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars on camera stuff, and I would say only thirty of it was relevant to the actually what I was doing. Mm. The other thirty was shit that, and a year later was gone. Got rid of it. This is stupid. I need this, and then I got rid of it. I need that, got rid of it. I bought a map box recently. It doesn't fit in any of the gear or any of the shoots that I bring it on, and so I take it off because it's heavy. So I bought a fucking map box so I can leave it at home for shoots. Right. Right? Like, still but that's part to of the process. Day. Yeah, no. And then you buy stuff that you realize that you don't need. So then yeah. you just sell it. Get, get rid, rid of it. it. And it's, it's, it's not a big deal. Um, I would say, like, yeah, one reason it's going to make you money. The other reason it's going to save you time, which essentially could be the same thing. Sure. Um, for me, that was my decision to sell this red camera that shoots at 8K. Uh, it's very cinema, gorgeous images, probably like the nicest images you can get out of a camera today Mm -hmm. for something that's a fraction of the price because it's going to speed things up like crazy. Like I'm, the file sizes are going to be smaller. I can edit quicker. I've got audio and video synced at the same time. Like there is, there's pros and cons. So you need to find the right tool for the job that you're working on. That's within the budget that you have. Yeah. If you have no money to spend on it, the camera you have is fine. (laughs) Whatever you currently have is good. Uh, and then once you get some money, I I do think that it's important to invest Mm -hmm. in yourself and the sure, make the upgrades, uh, as they come. But know that that's not the most important thing. Yeah. I mean, you have to reinvest in your business because if we never got a new camera, we'd still have a Sony Handycam. You know, we'd still be working on like these mini DV tapes. I think that the the margins are getting smaller and smaller and it's making less difference every year. Each camera that comes out, it's like, you know, the difference is so subtle. Like how... How, how many frames a second do we need to shoot in slow motion? Like, do you need a thousand frames a yeah. second? Like, you're going to get dope shit. Like, well, at even like... If you bought an A7S II, which, I, you know, at this point, it's probably the oldest 4K internal Sony they have. I think it's like two years old or something like that, right? That was like the first one that did internal 4K. You could buy that now, A7S II, for like, I don't know, two, I don't know, two grand, something like that, something, whatever it is. You can buy a Canon 70 or 24 to 70. That's not going to go old. That'll last for a long time. Right, the lenses, yeah. So you can spend three grand. And you can make probably fifty thousand dollars off that, that little just those two things. Obviously, you'll need you'll need a tripod, but yeah, you know, you can not you can get this stuff that's so small and just understand that all it needs to do is its job. Mm. Doesn't need to make you happy. Just needs to do its job. Doesn't need to make you happy. Yeah. So like sure. it's 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 like a it's not a home thing. It's a work thing. Get get you your know? your use out of it too. Yeah, and don't like run uh, at the the minute the new version comes out, yeah. sell your camera to upgrade it. Like it's it's like people that don't wear their car in. Like when if you buy a a car, a new car, whatever it is, you gotta beat that thing to the ground. Like use it for as long as you possibly can to really make sure you get your your the full value out. Yeah, of it. if I didn't tell you there was an update, like oh, just hear this new thing, you would probably still think your thing is the best thing. Yeah, you know, and you wouldn't notice the difference, right? Uh, let's do one more question here. I got uh, Joe Petrilli from New Jersey. Hey, 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 what's up, Joe? <laughs> hey, what up, Joey? Uh, how's that's just a, that's a thing that we do to fellow New Jersey people. It's like a, it's I'm like not from New out. Jersey, so fuck off. Yeah, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> um, how saturated do you think the filmmaking field will be in five years, and will the expectations of a good filmmaker increase with that? You know, I think like a lot of people think that uh, it's so saturated now. They look at it and they're like, oh my God, there's so many like wannabe filmmakers or talented filmmakers, people who are like filling up the market and trying to provide the same value. Like, If you think that it's saturated now, just wait for five years down the road and see how crazy it's going to be. Like, so that I think is your motivation to put everything you have into it right now mm-hmm. that you need to get started as soon as possible because it's the competition's not going to drop away. Yeah, there's just going to be more people with these higher end cameras because the prices are going to drop so much. People are developing an eye with Instagram. I think Instagram is like kind of turning a lot of it's an- a new college, <laughs> right? Like it's it's turning a lot of people into like being like 
having more of an eye for it, mm -hmm. people didn't know like what would a filter was. You know what I mean? Like yeah. a color grading or whatever. Now they're starting to understand a basic element of it and starting to have a better eye for it, Focusing. which I think is going to be, it's going to probably push more and more people into that world of being like, well, I can be a filmmaker. I can be a photographer. And then now you have a yeah. lot more competition. See, I, I think I'm probably have like the controversial view on this because I don't think that it will be more saturated. I think, and I think technology has proven this historically, that as things become more available and they become better and easier to use, it cuts through the uh, people using it between good and like if they're professional or if they're a hobbyist. So I think the amount of people, like if I separate Instagram out of this, I'm just talking about the, the question, which was, you know, is, is the film scene going to get more and more saturated in five years? Um, I think that was part one. I forget what part two was. Part two is but, like, uh, and then are the expectations of a filmmaker going to increase with right. that? Right. So, you know, let's talk about this. So 10 years ago, it's extremely difficult to get an image uh, that it, it takes five seconds to get out of in the Sony cameras now, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that there's more people using the Sony cameras now. It just means that it's easier to see through the bullshit. So I think as we all get smarter, as we all get better at this, we're all going to be able to identify who is good and who is not. Some people will not want to wait around. And I find this because as I've, you know, I've been, I've been doing this about 10 years now. So in the last 10 years, I've noticed that the amount of people that I would consider uh, being good at their job or the amount of people that are even available for the job, it's gone down in the film world for me. And I've met more people for sure. And that's made up for it because obviously time goes by, you meet more people, you network, blah, 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 blah. But like, I, I think that there's different levels you have to be aware of different tiers of like, okay, are we talking about the film scene? Are we talking about low budget videos scene? Are we talking about the wedding scene? Are we, you know, there's different areas and they, they expand and scale as time goes by. And it's like, you probably noticed this when we first started doing weddings. So we both started right around the same time. And it was like 2009, 2010, something like that. And anyone who had the 5D, you were like, fuck, we got to hire them. Is they're going to have immediately they're going to have good quality. It's going to look good. They got some lenses, whatever. And then everybody had a 5D and you were able to tell who was good and who was not good. So while there were more people, there was less people getting hired because you could tell the difference between good and bad easier. But then there was also the, you know, as somebody who's edited a lot of weddings that you didn't shoot, there's a difference between somebody that has a 5D that just bought it and yep. that's their first camera and their first time filming. Right. Like all the footage is shaky. They don't hold their B-roll for fucking five seconds. And then somebody who has been doing this for five years yeah. that has a better eye for it, that can hold a shot right. and, and do all the, keep the shot in focus. Um, do you see that there's more people today at the entry level position who are not very good, but they have nice cameras versus the middle to higher tier of people who are like very talented? They've put in the time. Maybe they haven't gotten 10,000 hours at their craft yet, but they've put in a significant amount of effort and energy. Um, to where that's not as high because it still takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and i think yeah. a lot of people get really excited about hobbies and be like, i'm going to be a filmmaker and then they pick it up and then they right. let it die they let it die i mean that's what i'm saying is like you can have more people doing stuff it doesn't mean that a scene is more saturated and if anything it might be saturated with idiots Mm -hmm. Which means it's up to you to be really good at what you're doing, good at your craft. What's good about this is the fact that there's, that's why we have different budget projects. Yeah. You have people that aren't as talented that are just getting started out. That's where the 300 to $500 projects are perfect right. for. Exactly. Take the, like, yeah, get as many of those small projects and small jobs as you can. And the more you develop your skills, the, the higher you can raise up with the budgets, the money you're charging, because you're, you're delivering so much more. A lot of people just see it as like you're delivering higher quality or you're better, but there's so much more than just quality of the visuals you're putting out. It's like you, you learn how to deal with clients. You've delivered, you can deliver on time. Yeah. Uh, you can guarantee them that you're not going to have to reshoot something because you screwed it up the first time. You're going to guarantee that you can get it right the first time. Uh, and those are the things that come with experience. Yes. So and it raises the expectations of everyone. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, while all those things are true, 
there is um, something to be said for the expectations of both what your clients set for what they want and what you set for what you're delivering. Mm -hmm. And just make sure they're matching. And if you can match them, match your expectations so you're in the same wavelength, good communication, then it doesn't matter how saturated a scene is. And as you said this before, like last year we, we talked, you don't need a ton of clients to be successful. You know, you just need a couple that believe in you. So that's like the most important part, I think, is like, are you trying to make a video for every single person who needs a video in your city? No, that's unrealistic. But what, if you can find a couple clients that you can really connect with and give them a good product, you can make a lot of money. Love it. Uh, any last words? Uh, yes, actually. Here's the last word for you. I got you a present. What? 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 What is this? That's my coming to LA present for you. What is this? <laughs> no. <laughs> this is insane. This so <laughs> now you can sleep with the rock. Oh, that's bad. That's really. I can't believe you did. Wow. That's amazing. For those of you who can't see, it is a ginormous blanket with a portrait of the rock on it. <laughs> Natalie is going to love this. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. This is really, really thoughtful. Look at that. Where'd you get this? I had a custom made. <laughs> no, you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> you had this custom made? Yeah. Oh I was actually going to mail it to you when I lost it. Remember? I was like, oh, I'm sending you a present. What's your address? Oh, I totally forgot. And then I couldn't find it. And then I found it. <laughs> you lost it? So I, I've been sitting on this for like six months. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, it's a gag on gift, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect you to actually sleep with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It might get weird. It's going to get weird now. Now this whole thing got weird. Yeah. Once I, I started to get you a weird blanket <laughs> so that you could lay underneath the rock's head and just realize how ridiculous it yeah, is. Yeah, but how yeah. cool it is. No, it's beautiful. Thank you so much for that. That, that really means a lot. Um, if we want to send people somewhere to see your work chrisnewhart.com is that the place to go chrisnewhart.com sure that's my work um my company is booklight creative so that's just booklight.co booklight.co b-o-o-k-l-i-g-h-t dot co. co yeah that's my company thanks for doing the show again thank you all and also if anyone's in ireland hit me up i have some shoots coming up there and i need crew <laughs> yes okay <laughs> we might be able to get some people some yeah. jobs yeah cool dude thank you for doing this thank you man thank you everybody and that's the podcast for this week. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to find out more about this podcast, you can go to groundupshow.com. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. See you next week.